Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us today. This is Tiffany Amig um, from the CAP program, and I'm happy to be joined by Connie Bodner today. Um, and she's here to present Implementing Your CAF Recommendations, How Museums for America Can Help. Um, we're going to get started in just a moment, um, but I wanted to just familiarize you with the, um, the webinar format. Um, I noticed that many of you have found the chat box over to the left. Uh, feel free throughout the webinar to continue to introduce yourselves and as additional participants join us, you'll see them introducing themselves there. Um, but also, if you have questions along the way, um, we expect Connie to just go through her presentation and then take time for questions and answers at the end. But if you have questions along the way, feel free to pose them in that chat box and we'll go through them at the end of the webinar. Um, so you don't have to wait to the end to ask a question. You'll also see down at the bottom of your screen some web links. For those of you who haven't used the, um, the Adobe Connect webinar system before, in order to visit those web links, you can highlight uh, a, um, a title just by clicking on it. And then you'll click the Browse to button that appears at the bottom of the box. And that'll open a new uh, window in your browser. So um, those all pertain to different items that Connie will be referring to throughout her presentation. So we'll get to that eventually. But I wanted to let you know how to use them because it's a little bit tricky. So without further ado, I want to introduce Connie and thank her so much for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to hear about the Museums for America program and learn in particular how to bridge a CAP assessment with a Museums for America grant proposal. All right. Well, thank you, Tiffany. And I want to add my thanks to uh, Tiffany's for your joining us today. And I also want to congratulate you on completing your CAP work or being very close to it. Um, also to thank Tiffany and Liz Kurt for shepherding through this first cohort of the new CAP. Um, here at IMLS, we respect the tremendous amount of effort that goes into administering and participating in this program, and our sincerest hope is that you've found it worthwhile as an important foundation for building capacity and collections care uh, at your institution. I'm a former capper myself, and it was one of the most rewarding experiences that I ever engaged in. What we want to do today is encourage you to think about IMLS's Museums for America grant program as a resource for implementing your CAP recommendations. Uh, we want to take some of the mystery out of the application and the review process and share some really tremendous stories of institutions that have successfully done this. Um, as Tiffany said, we'll have plenty of time for your questions and we hope that by the end of this you're inspired to start drafting an, an application to MFA. This is a general plan. We'll look at Museums for America, or uh, MFA for short, and how it's different from CAP. Uh, we'll look at what makes a successful MFA project, the eligibility criteria. We'll touch on funding levels and what you can and can't uh, include in your project cost. Then we'll look at about, um, very briefly, at about a half dozen examples of organizations that have completed CAP and then applied successfully to MFA in order to carry out those recommendations. We'll follow that with a few tips to keep in mind and a list of contacts and resources that we hope you'll find helpful. And then we'll open it up to questions and, and I'll do my best to answer them and promising, of course, to get back to you after the presentation on anything that, uh, that we need to research. So the formal description of MFA is that it is a competitive, peer-reviewed grant program designed to support projects that strengthen the ability of an individual museum to serve its public. And I think that it is worth unpacking that a bit by looking at these individual words and concepts. Competitive means that your application has to be better than just um, most others, okay? And as an indicator of that, these are the results of the 2017 grant cycle. And in the first column are the numbers of applications that we received in each project category with a total at the bottom. Uh, in the second are numbers of awards that we made in each category. 
uh, the third lists the total funds requested by all the applications and in the final column are the dollars that we awarded. So the one you want to pay attention to is collection stewardship because that's the category that you would most likely apply through. And as you can see, we were able to fund about 24% of the applications that we received by numbers and about 18% of the requests by dollar amount. And we did a little better than that, that, uh, that overall average in collection stewardship with 28% funded by number and 23% dollar amount. Uh, we would dearly love to be able to fund every request that we receive, but the funding's limited and it runs out before the requests do. Now, should this scare you? Absolutely not. It's only met as a heads up that it's a more rigorous process and that you'll be competing for these dollars along with a lot of other organizations. So how do we decide which applications get funded and which ones don't? Well, key is the fact that MFA is peer-reviewed. Museum professionals with deep experience in collections, care, and conservation will read and score your application, and they'll compare it against the criteria that we at IMLS have identified and to which you'll be preparing your application. We think this is the best way to make sure that your application is evaluated by those most knowledgeable about current trends and best practices in collections care. And MFA is a grant program. Technically, CAP is not. Very appropriately, CAP has provided technical assistance and advice through the assessors that visited your institution. And that is different in the federal world from a grant program. In a grant program, you request funding to support a project that you design and defend within the parameters of the notice of funding opportunity or the guidelines. If you're funded, then you're expected to carry out that project and uh, all the while, of course, following federal rules and regulations as you do it, but without further input from the agency that funds you. So that, in a nutshell, is the difference between a technical assistance program and a grant. MFA supports projects, and that might sound um, incredibly obvious, but there's, of course, a, a backstory to that, too. You can think of a project as a set of related activities that you put together to achieve one or more particular outcomes or goals. And taken together, this set of activities has a beginning and a middle and an end. There are certain people who will carry out these activities, and they'll use very specific techniques and equipment and supplies and other resources to do it. And these activities will be accomplished for a certain amount of money, which relates to your grant. And uh, some of that might come from IMLS only, or it might come partly from IMLS and partly from you. Project support is very different from operating support, which is money that's provided to offset the expenses of your normal business, and that's an important distinction. So what makes a successful MFA project? And this is content that we extracted from our, our notice of funding opportunity, but we think it's important. When we look at which projects have been really successful in achieving their goals, we were able to identify four characteristics. And as you think about how to structure your project, you, you might want to keep these characteristics in mind. Um, first, institutional impact. Uh, your project will address a key goal identified in, in your institution's strategic plan. Helping you live into your strategic plan is a central element of the Museums for America grant program at IMLS. It's the only one that has that as a central element, but, uh, but it's important. Second here is in-depth knowledge. Um, the project design in a, in a good project uh, in this regard reflects a very thorough understanding of current practice and knowledge about the subject matter, and it, whether that is in collections management or conservation or storage or any other aspect of collections work. This is where your CAP report will come in useful. You've got excellent information about current practice and subject matter knowledge at your fingertips in that document, and so this is a great um, a great resource as you parlay that into funding from us. Third, project-based design. And we've already talked about the fact that a, a, a work plan uh, should consist of a set of logical interrelated activities that are tied directly to addressing the key need or challenge that you've identified for your project. 
Uh, every element of your work plan should be within the box that you've designed to attack the problem that you want to solve and nothing should be out there on the outside. Fourth, demonstrable results. Uh, the project generates measurable results that tie directly to the need or the challenge that it was designed to address. So in short, you should be able to measure your success in solving your problem. An MFA is distinguished from other IMLS funding programs by its focus on an individual museum and by extension that museum's particular community or public and that museum's collection. Uh, what you ask us to support might be exactly the same as what a museum across town or in a neighboring state asks for and that is totally okay with us. Uh, you might collaborate with another museum if that makes sense for your project but you're not required to do it in this program. And uh, if we fund the same kind of project in 15 different locations in a grant cycle, we're, we're happy with that. It's all about local impact. And last but not least, MFA, like all IMLS grant programs, focuses on service to the public. And as a recent CAP participant, this is likely to be by improving one or more aspects of preserving and caring for the collections that you hold in trust for your public. You're already aware that your tax-exempt status is tied to public service, and this is just further confirmation that the privilege of using taxpayer dollars should be tied to improving something on behalf of the people that you serve. So who is eligible to apply for an MFA grant? Well, in large part, the eligibility criteria to apply for MFA funding is the same as it was for CAP. Uh, you need to be a unit of state or local government or a private nonprofit organization with tax-exempt status. Um, you have to be located in one of the 50 states or one of the territories, and you must qualify either as a museum or is a nonprofit agency responsible for the operation of a museum. So what types of institutions are included in, the, in our definition of museum? Well, to answer that, we provide this list. Um, this is from the legislation that uh, allows us access to uh, public money and gives us the, the authority to distribute it, but it's not exhaustive. So even if your organization's name does not include the word museum, you might still be eligible as one if you meet the requirements that are set out in, um, in our notice of funding opportunity. I want to make sure you see here that museums in this definition might be standalone independent organizations or they might be located within another one like a college or a university or an Indian tribe. And that is all okay too. Uh, some of these other requirements, in addition to these governance and geographic requirements, to qualify as a museum, you must also use a professional staff of at least one staff member or FTE, full-time equivalent. That person can be paid or unpaid. Um, if you're using a combination of people, they can also be in a combination of paid or unpaid, but that single person or the FTE has to be primarily engaged in the acquisition, care, or exhibition of collections to the public. Uh, you need to be organized on a permanent basis for essentially educational or aesthetic purposes. You need to own or use, uh, equally good, tangible objects, either animate or inanimate, which is why we can fund zoos and aquaria and uh, botanical gardens and arboreta. Um, you have to care for those objects and you have to exhibit the objects to the general public on a regular basis through facilities that you own or operate for at least 120 days a year. And there's the difference from CAP. Uh, I believe the CAP um, limit is 90 days, but to qualify for this funding you have to be open 120 days. We don't define what a day is, we just say that you have to be open for 120 of them. And the implication there is lots of museums are open on Sunday afternoons, but not Sunday mornings. That's okay. That still counts as a day. Uh, we mentioned that you could also qualify as if you're a nonprofit agency responsible for the operation of a museum. 
Um, for more on that, I urge you to consult the MFA Notice of Funding Opportunity and then to call us with any questions that you might have about your particular situation. That can get complex, but it is uh, resolvable. So let's talk offline about that. So how much can you request and how many applications are you allowed to submit within a single grant cycle? These are very important questions. It turns out that you've got two options in terms of how much money you can request. Option one, five to $25,000 with no cost share permitted. And that's important to notice. It's, it's, it's different from saying that no cost share is required. In our in this program, at this funding level, you may not provide a cost share. And if you do, we won't be able to review your proposal. And the reason for that is that we're looking for projects that can be completed for between five and 25,000. So this is not $25,000 of federal investment for a project that costs a lot more. And we hope that this favors uh, or levels the playing field a little bit anyway for the small and medium-sized organizations or perhaps somebody that hasn't had deep experience in federal um, uh, grant management. Option two is you can apply for some amount between 25,000 and one and the maximum of 250,000 which is a new maximum this year. In that case a one-to-one -one cost share is required and that can be in the form of cash, it can be staff or volunteer time, and that's important to keep in mind, uh, or third-party contributions. The only thing it can't be is funds from another federal source. The second question, how many applications can you file? If you choose option one and request between five and 25,000 with no cost share, then you are limited to one MFA application in this grant cycle. If you choose option two and ask for between 25,001 and 250,000 with a one-to-one -one cost share, then there's no limit on the number of applications your museum can submit this round uh, to MFA. And if you are, have questions about that, maybe we can address them in the, in the Q&A. There's a strategy there, but for now we'll leave it at this. Option one, only one application, that's all you can apply for. Option two, you can put in as many applications as you wish. Right, now let's turn to what kinds of cost you can include in your project. Uh, this is a partial list of the most common examples of allowable costs that we see in MFA projects. And as you can see here, it's everything from personnel, salaries and wages and benefits, travel expenses, materials, supplies, software and equipment that's directly related to what you're going to do, equipment to improve collection storage and exhibit environments, third-party costs, that would be uh, consultants and in some cases sub-awardees, publication design and printing, staff and volunteer training, internships, fellowships, and indirect or overhead costs. In terms of unallowable costs, um, these are a few. And what's important to internalize here is that these kinds of unallowable costs can't appear anywhere in your project. It's not the kind of thing where it's OK if, as long as you're not asking IMLS to support it. But quite differently, this can't appear anywhere. So, and I think one of the ones that's likely to be uh, of interest to you all is the construction or renovation of facilities. Uh, you can't have a project that involves construction and just not ask us to support that. It, it can't appear as part of the project. Um, we will point you to additional resources that will help you determine what's allowable and what isn't in the, uh, the MFA guidelines. Uh, but as I'll, I'll say many times over, if you have questions about this when you're preparing an application, please call or email us and we'll be happy to discuss the finer points of this with you. Okay, this is the really fun part. We are thrilled, of course, to see CAP participants be successful in implementing their recommendations of their assessments. But it's exceptionally nice to see instances in which MFA gets to be a part of that. So I've selected six examples here to share with you. And as a group, they show, I think, a really remarkable range of institution type and size, as well as diversity in project activities. 
Uh, the first two here were part of the 2012 CAP cohort, which probably means they actually did their CAPs a year later. Um, and in each case, they applied for and received MFA funding in the 2016 grant uh, applic uh, grant competition. Sorry, uh, the Seminole Tribe of Florida put in high density movable shelving in their museum's main building vault, and by doing this, they were able to improve and expand capacity for their museum quality storage. The uh, Roosevelt Wildlife Collections, which are at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, uh, got a grant to assess the condition of 4,000 uh, at-risk bird and bat specimens, which they had identified as part of their CAP work. And then they databased them. They implemented an integrated pest management system designed um, especially for them. And they rehoused them to improve collections management and care. The Hanford Mills Museum in East Meredith, uh, New York, participated in CAP in 2014 and has since received two MFA awards. In 2015, they got funding to organize their storage areas uh, to conduct the first ever full collections inventory, to verify and document key data, and to implement routine housing uh, housekeeping activities, all uh, very common CAP recommendations. And in that project, they identified 9,000 found in collections objects. And they've just, this last month, received another MFA grant to process and reconcile those 9,000 objects. So they're, they're building a very, very nice track record there um, and going at it in a processual way uh, to improve their collections care. Santa Fe Botanical Garden in New Mexico uh, use their MFA grant to purchase and implement a comprehensive database and software system. And by doing that, they're improving the management care and the accessibility of their botanical collections. The Celia Thaxter Museum in Vaughn Cottage in Portsmouth, uh, New Hampshire, uh, applied and re applied for and received one of the five to twenty-five thousand dollar grants. Uh, that did not allow a match, and they're improving the basic environment of their collections, uh, by, and they're also conducting a full inventory, upgrading their storage methods, and recording their new storage locations, all in the name of improving both collections management and care. Verde Valley Archaeology Center has also gotten two MFA grants since they finished their cap uh, of 2014. Uh, this, in the first year, they prepared themselves to improve collection storage uh, environment and care by purchasing sets of conservation supplies and tools that were recommended by their CAP assessor. And then this year, they received another five to $25,000 grant, but this time it's in the learning experiences category. And uh, this project focuses on updating their exhibition on the Yavapai Apache Nation in collaboration with the nation's cultural directors. And I just want to draw your attention to this because it's not unusual for organizations that are successful in managing uh, collection stewardship grants because of their CAP participation to move on to another category and be successful yet again. All right, now we're going to move to some very brief tips. Um, these are gleaned from our collective experience and working with applications of all kinds submitted to MFA, and they're, but they're really crucial and important um, for anybody undertaking this. First on the list is to be, please be aware that you have to be registered in three places in order to apply for an IMLS grant. And this is pretty true for uh, all federal grants these days. You have to have a DUNS number, you have to have an active SAM.gov registration, and you have to be registered with grants.gov. And if you're just starting out, it's important to know that you have to do these things in this order. Um, get the DUNS number first, or at a minimum, find out where it is. You probably already have one because you'll need that to apply for SAM. And then you'll need your approved and activated SAM registration to apply for grants.gov. Uh, important to remember that your SAM registration expires every year and that you have to renew it. You can check your status at any time by going to uh, the website www.sam.gov. 
um, and see how you are. So maybe you weren't the person who registered last year, um, but you've got that responsibility this year. That's, that's how you get to the important information. And in addition, your grants.gov password expires every 60 days. And if an account is left inactive for a year or more, um, they, they have the right and do remove all account roles. And that can take a long time to detangle. So make sure you know who your grants.gov um, authorized organizational representative is. And be sure that you know the username and the password and that those, those are in place. Both of those websites, by the way, have very robust help features and FAQs. And if you call grants.gov, there's an actual human being that answers the phone and helps you out. So um, good for them. Very helpful resources. Okay, tip number two, mark your calendar. MFA applications are due by 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time on December 1 this year. Uh, we are not allowed to take any applications that are filed after that. So, um, so be good to yourself and keep that in mind and try really hard not to push it to 11.59. Uh, some other important dates. Awards will be announced in September of 2018. We, we are usually allowed to do that by the middle of September. And this will be for projects that start on October 1, November 1, or December 1 of 2018. And start date is your choice. Um, oftentimes people will say they need a little a breathing space between the date they find out uh, they get the funding from us, which is mid-September, uh, and so they might opt for a November 1 or a December 1 start date. But there are other folks who are very confident that they can gear up in a few days, and so then they choose an October 1 start date. Okay, a third tip is check out our website. And sooner rather than later is probably a good idea there too. But here you'll be able to explore eligibility criteria that we've, that we've touched on today, but you'll be able to do that in greater depth. You can download sample applications. Um, you can access the Museums of for America Notice of Funding Opportunities, which provides all the instructions for preparing an application. Um, you will be able to access all the required application forms, and you can search a database of previously awarded grants, which is sometimes very helpful to see how other folks have put their projects together. It might give you some good ideas about, um, about how you might approach yours. And I promised some resources, and here they are. And as I understand it, the, these links are inherent in the web links at the bottom of the uh, screen here. But we decided to put two batches of content into pre-recorded webinars this year, which you can access at your leisure. And you can access them in one of two ways. You can either click on a link and listen to it and watch slides in the same format that we're doing today. Or you can download a PDF which has a script of what we said along with the, uh, the PowerPoint slides. So the first one is choosing a funding opportunity. And I just recommend that everybody check that out. Um, it covers some of the things that we did today, but it gives you good hints and suggestions for uh, applying for an IMLS grant no matter which program you choose. And then we created a, a new this year webinar on just the forms with detailed tips on completing the forms that are required for all our grant programs. Uh, and then uh, we'll be doing a webinar for Museums for America applicants tomorrow at 1 p.m. And if you are uh, want to check that out, we've got a link there to the instructions. Uh, and the links to the actual webinar. You don't need to register in advance. Uh, you just log in and you need a telephone. If your, um, if your computer doesn't have um, audio capability, uh, but you might want to check out the system in advance. I didn't know my own computer always asks for a Java update whenever I do this. So yours might as well. It would save you some time. But we hope you can uh, join us for that if you're interested. We'll also record that and have the transcript posted on our website as well. 
All right, in terms of contact, um, Mark Feidel and I serve as the points of contact for the collection stewardship category of Museums for America, and this is our direct information. So please know that we'll be very happy to hear from you if you'd like to call us with questions about anything you've heard today or questions that you encounter as you're putting together an application, or if you just want to float some ideas for a project by us, we'd, we'd welcome the contact. Right, I'm happy to hear questions. All right, thank you so much, Connie. This has been a wonderful overview. Um, and we do have one question that came up while you were talking, and that's from Alex Barker. And he asks, when you say that we can't include construction and renovation in the project, can we list the CAP recommendations that in a later stage of the larger project, construction renovation is needed, but it's not part of the current request? Sure, you can you can mention that. Um, I would just say do it in a way that doesn't confuse reviewers um, who might wonder if we're if you're asking for support for that. But no, I think that's a fine thing. It's always good to for us to be able for us and reviewers to be able to understand how this particular effort uh, rolls into an organization's long-term collections care plan, just make it really clear what you're asking us to support and what um, somebody else will have the privilege to support. That's a great question. Okay, and then there's another question from Melissa asking if the grant can cover the conservation of collections or key pieces of collections. Absolutely it can. Um, and in fact, for s some of you all might remember the Conservation Project Support Grant Program that IMLS used to have. Um, in that program, we covered uh, surveys, uh, general surveys, item by item surveys, environmental surveys, treatment and environmental improvements. All of those functions have been rolled into Museums for America. And actually, it's a good thing. You've got access to a bigger pool of money this way. But yes, we, um, we are happy to help out with conservation of single objects or, uh, or larger collections. Great. That's, let's see, I'm, I'm waiting in case it looks like there may be a couple of other folks who are typing right now. So I'm going ah, to take a minute to see if additional questions roll in. Good. I'd love to know if folks on the line have applied for MFA before. Um, I don't know if we can ask that question or if people just want to respond, but um, we've, uh, you know, IML or IMLS has been involved with CAP for a long, long time, and we've always tried to figure out how we could capture how folks address the next stage of it. You know, who comes to us, who might apply to NEH, who is able to take their CAP report and turn it into a request or a support for a request from a local foundation. Um, so anybody wants to, to uh, share stories. Ah, James Lining says, not yet. Yes, that great sounds answer. Like it's, yeah, but soon, I hope. Yes. OK, a question from Mary Beth Applegate in Connecticut. She asks, um, since you don't cover rehab of the museum building, and this was well over half of their CAP recommendations, can, um, can you point in the direction of grants for um, building renovation? I would love to talk with you about the nature of the CAP recommendations, because the re rehab in the federal sense uh, means um, sort of like really large scale building, like new roofs, new walls, new foundations, new um, interior plumbing work. The reason we can't support that kind of work is that our budget is just too small. But oftentimes, uh, CAP recommendations will say, you've got to do something about your HVAC, or you've got to do something about uh, uh, window coverings, because there's too much light coming in. Um, those are the kinds of things that actually we can help with. 
and those are usually classified not as rehab but as environmental improvements. So I hope that doesn't sound like um, like smoke and mirrors, but I would say connect up with us to talk about the specific recommendations and then we could help you uh, either connect into Museums for America or take a look at some of the NEH programs. But don't be scared off by that. Thank you. And and I'm going to just reinforce that because I know, um, you know, we hear from folks uh, that are hesitant to call us because they think that we're too busy or um, that we don't want to hear from individual museums. And I would just encourage you all, if you have questions about that, it's so much better to have initial conversations with Connie or with Mark um, before you go through that whole effort. Um, make sure you're, you're doing it correctly. I'm sure that she's happy to um, to have those conversations with any of you. Right, absolutely. Um, let's see, one more let's... clarification from Corey. Um, she asks, they're looking to take an old storage space or closet that's in, in disrepair and turn it into a storage facility for their fine art collection. Okay. Uh, she's saying she, she doesn't feel that the grant would cover repairs to the room, but would it cover storage equipment? Absolutely. We get lots and lots of requests every year for storage, museum quality storage furniture, which can be a, a real substantial cost and we can certainly um, help with that. Oftentimes what people will do in trying to uh, repair an old space is they look for other labor to do to do the things we can't pay for the the um, you know the the wall board and the electrical work and uh, replacing windows or whatever else or closing in windows that kind of thing it works out very nicely to do that separately and apart never mention it in your application to us other than as context if if you feel that's important and then ask us to help you buy the furniture to put in it and if there needs to be some sort of climate control or data loggers or um, other specialized equipment all of that we can help with that's great it's great to hear specific examples like that mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see additional questions rolling in. I am going to assume that that's because everyone is jumping over to the Museums for America website and um, already <laughs> researching and thinking about formulating uh, grant requests. But I want to take a minute to just say thank you, Connie, for being with us. It's, it's so helpful. Um, I think this is just such an obvious progression for CAP participants to apply for Museums for America, and I'm hopeful that um, this was very helpful to a lot of you who are participating today and that if you have additional qu questions you will contact Connie. Well Tiffany I appreciate the invitation you know this is truly the first time we've ever done this and I'll be uh, my fingers are crossed that that it is helpful to folks and um, and that they do give us calls and we will look for really fabulous applications coming in um, at least a day or two before December 1. <laughs> Go. <laughs> right. yeah. Thank you all.